you were because of the hurricane to get there. So even if you had planned to come, some people couldn't make it. So thanks for inviting us uh, to present on this. And I uh, just want to confirm you can see my screen that that screen sharing did work as well. Yes. Okay, super. Uh, and hi to everybody in South Zone. I saw some of you on there. So awesome. Nice to see you guys again. Um, if my slides will advance. There we go. Okay. So uh, like Megan mentioned, we did present this federally at the Sci-Fi Annual Education Conference in St. John. Um, we are members of the Federal Provincial Territorial Food Safety Committee, which is the Umbrella Group, and underneath that there are working groups. And so this presentation is going to go over updates on two working groups. The first one is titled Food Retail Food Safety National Working Group. And the second and admittedly far more interesting one is the online food sales working group. <laughs> and then after our presentation, uh, we have um, an interactive portion with the Mentimeter and we can get some feedback from the field because that online food sales is certainly a big issue across the country. And the working group is happy to gather information and figure out what we can do with that to protect food safety in Canada. But for, up first is food retail and food safety working group. Um, there was a lot of work done on this working group prior to 2018 and the goal of this working group was to harmonize the food safety training criteria for food safety training courses across the country and to have a centralized point for these courses to come in and receive approval. Um, that work sort of fell apart in 2018 uh, just because the group disbanded. We didn't have members. There was no co-chairs. And so uh, Natalia's director and myself are co-chairs of this working group now uh, as of 2020. And we've been moving forward with the work since then. So the big deliverable will be this framework for the national recognition and harmonization of food safety training programs in the food, retail and food services sector. Um, which we realize is a horrible acronym and a very lengthy title. So if anybody has any suggestions, <laughs> we also would appreciate some input on that. Um, it will have to fit, you know, approval by this on uh, the wallet cards or anything that any course seeking national recognition, um, you know, uses as proof. And so it needs to be something recognizable to all inspectors in the field. Uh, so we will work on that. Uh, if you have suggestions, we're we're kind of stumped, I think, or hasn't been our focus. Um, we've had to rewrite most of this framework and the annexes, uh, and do have participation of all 13 jurisdictions, uh, provincial and territorial, which has been really wonderful. Um, so certainly there's been challenges, but we've been able to align the criteria across all 13 uh, provincial and territorial jurisdictions. Uh, the food safety requirements were pretty consistent already, uh, but there were some process requirements uh, and other requirements that varied pretty significantly, like expiry dates or uh, retesting or challenge tests and things like that. Um, so we've gotten those challenges addressed. So like I said, it isn't the most interesting working group necessarily <laughs> on the front line, but it really does benefit us as public health professionals uh, with the national recognition of programs. It makes it easier. There's assurance of common course standards. So when we are asking operators or others to take these courses, you know they're receiving the same training, whether they took it in Alberta or Saskatchewan or Prince Edward Island or Nunavut. Um, and for those who do work in the approval process, uh, it does streamline the approval process and lessen the workload across all the PTs uh, to a working board instead. Um, so what do we have left to do? We've got a finished review and drafting of a couple of the annexes. One of the annex is instructor-led courses and the other one is uh, self-study type courses and the endorsement, we need endorsement by that umbrella group that I was talking about, the FPT Food Safety Committee. And then we'll have to work on implementation. So we're still working out the kinks in terms of having a web host and how the input comes in and how the communication goes out. But the assessment of the courses and the content of the courses and process are pretty much complete. We're just waiting on that endorsement. So that's it for that. Uh, that one's pretty quick. <laughs> we're hoping to get that done in the next couple of months. Uh, and then that will be communicated out to the provinces and territories as well. Uh, the second working group, and like I said, it's more interesting because it is a bit newer um, and there's certainly some interesting, well, lots of interesting things that come up all the time, the online food sales working group. So uh, I'll start uh, explaining this and then I'll hand it over to Natalia um, for the rest of it and then to lead us through the Mentimeter interactive part. And I realize I'm talking quickly. I will say in St. John, we had 45 minutes to do this presentation. I recognize we have half hour here, so I am trying to go through it a little bit quicker. So 
Uh, we don't run out of time before we get to the fun interactive part. Um, so please also keep questions in mind and ask me anytime if, if I've said something too quickly or you have additional questions. Um, the background for this online food sales working group uh, was we noticed and, and there's evidence and scientific data that the sale of online foods has been increasing for some time and definitely skyrocketed um, sort of into COVID and post COVID. And so we needed to come together as a PT working group to discuss these emerging online food sales issues because we're seeing the same issues across the country to identify gaps in the food safety and regulatory frameworks uh, and to brainstorm how do we mitigate that risk? Because ultimately the point of any of these working groups and of the food safety committee is protecting public health uh, and keeping the food safe. So uh, this graph just shows sort of increases and amounts over time of different types of online food sales. All of the categories here, I guess, are, are related to facilities that we often connect with anyways, outside of the delivery one. So restaurants or grocery stores, uh, food producers, things like that. What we did find when we were working through the online food sales working group that's not addressed in this graph is the online food sales that don't follow that sort of business to consumer model. So those are really looking at businesses um, to a consumer. And so there's four different types of business models that we had to consider. Uh, business to business is like Cisco selling to a restaurant. It's a business selling to another business before it gets to the end user. Business to consumer is like Walmart selling directly to you. Consumer to consumer is me selling <laughs> my stuff to you. Um, and consumer to business would be me, uh, you know, in my home bread business, which I don't have. This is an example <laughs> selling to uh, the co-op or something like that. So it's really these consumer to consumer um, type interactions that we found are the biggest gaps and biggest confusion and, and potentially biggest risk. And a lot of those sales occur through social media, marketplace, Craigslist or other you know, person to person type interactions like that. Uh, and then we also found that there was a bit of a gap around food delivery. So ready to eat foods, uh, Uber Eats and skip the dishes, but also grocery delivery services. And so the issues as as everyone is likely quite familiar with is the risk of foodborne illness. Um, there's also issues around the ingredients used. Where are they coming from? Are they what they say they are? Uh, that relates to the last one too. Are you selling something as product A, but really it's product B, uh, food fraud? Uh, is a big concern federally, uh, and we do see it come out in these online food sales. Regulations vary across the country uh, in terms of the ability to sell food online and, and what the follow-up is, but there's certainly some regulatory concerns there as well. And then exploitation. So these online food sales um, have been linked in some studies and in some cases to exploitation of people, um, especially uh, new Canadians and other people who are at higher risk and more vulnerable to exploitation. So I um, pulled some examples and I don't. Those of you who I think I might be Facebook friends with will realize I'm never on there and don't use it. And I know when I first posted this, people were annoyed at my number of messages, but I don't use Facebook. But I did go on there for the purpose of this presentation um, and went to Marketplace and just searched food. So super simple query and what came up to start uh, was, what appears to be like kind of tasty looking, but definitely a potentially hazardous food and not necessarily prepared in an approved facility. There were all sorts of things on there. Uh, commercial foods, prepackaged, uh, might be sealed, might not be sealed. Allowable homemade foods. So both in Alberta and Saskatchewan, the requirements are slightly different, but there is an allowability for home prepared foods to be sold, uh, typically low risk or non-potentially hazardous foods. So in some cases, that's what I came across and, and we don't have any restrictions here and mostly in most of the country in terms of advertising. So that was OK. But then there were things that wasn't as clear just from the picture if it was a low risk food that would fall under that sort of regulatory exemption. Um, there was definitely meat on there for sale um, on a concrete floor, cut and wrapped possibly somewhere, possibly not. Uh, this one I put in. For the price of apple crisp, <laughs> nobody's probably paying that, but also that there's there's claims on there and there's no verification of these claims. 
Uh, is the person who prepared it food safety certified? Did they think the apple crisp is? But to the public, this might seem something that, hey, that's a safe purchase, and it, it might not be at all. Uh, there were labeling issues, which is definitely covered federally, but nevertheless are present on these online food sales. Um, there is a lot, a fair amount of ongoing sort of food prep, meal prep services available on there um, that based on the pictures are unlikely to be being done in an approved facility. <laughs> and then I put this one in last because it was fun <laughs> that uh, the people are getting creative. People are looking for ways to make money, anything you can, anything that will sell, but that um, these are might overlap with other regulatory issues as well because uh, you can't sell alcohol this way either. So uh, and meat and cheese uh, create kind of an issue, but that one's fun. So I will now turn it over to Natalia and maybe you can just, I'll keep sharing my screen and click through slides and then let you share when we get to Mentimeter. Perfect. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thanks for, the, for, for setting the pace there, Kelsey. Um, I'm, I'll try and match it. Uh, so uh, our, our online food sales working group objectives. Um, so the first one is identifying um, existing regulatory frameworks, gaps, and enforcement measures as they relate to online food sales um, at the FPT level. So we've already done um, quite a bit of work in this area. We've mapped out existing regulatory frameworks and have identified many gaps in how the existing regulations support online um, sales and purchase of foods in Canada. So some of the very general themes that we've identified in our work so far include that consumers and people involved in these like consumer to consumer sales often don't seem to have knowledge of the regulatory requirements, um, as I'm sure you guys can probably attest to. Uh, consumers may not be aware of the risks of purchasing food online. Um, and generally speaking, there's a lack of defined policy and guidance that's specific to online food sales, both for inspection staff and consumers. So it's difficult to identify online food sales unless there's a complaint um, in many cases and monitoring and proactive surveillance can be difficult. Um, and the regulations that govern the sale of online foods vary across the country in scope and enforcement. So, um, you know, the sale of certain foods from private homes without additional permitting requirements is allowed in some jurisdictions and entirely prohibited in others. So um, this would make like a one size fits all approach very difficult um, in terms of guidance. Um, and then our second objective is to establish a strategic communication framework to engage and educate businesses and consumers about the risks associated with online uh, sale of foods. So we've started to brainstorm what we need around communication. Um, this is still in its planning phase, but um, it seems like educating consumers is, is a good place to start with guidance. And lastly, um, researching international best practices related to online sales of food and making recommendations for adoption in Canada at the federal, provincial, and territorial level. So yeah, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this, I wanted to include pink sauce. Um, I don't know how many are familiar with it, but it's an extreme example of online food sales, in my opinion. I think it's worth mention being, mentioning because with the right combination of factors, so you know, you have a novel product, a viral video on social media, and you know, opportunity to make money as the demand for this product is high. Um, you know, it posed a significant food safety hazard. So, um, for some background, a chef based in Miami, Florida, created what she calls pink sauce, a sauce made of sunflower seed oil, honey, chili, garlic, and dragon fruit. And the sauce went viral on TikTok, which led to an online retail operation. But thankfully, consumers with good sense asked questions about the food safety of the product and its labeling. So the label, um, it had, I think, 400 servings per container or something. So people were confused about that and asking questions. And the ingredient deck also said that it contained milk, but the packaging didn't call for any refrigeration or feature a best before date or anything like that. So um, eventually the product was reformulated, approved by FDA and has been legally sold since January of 2023. And the story has you know, a positive outcome, but as you can see, um, good marketing, a well-designed website and product label can easily fool consumers into believing that a product comes from an approved source. Um, so now we'll we'll hop over to the interactive portion. Just a sec. We'll that, and I will take over sharing. 
All right. I don't know how many of you have um, used Mentimeter before, but um, if you if you uh, go ahead and um, use your phone to scan the QR code there, um, it should open up the um, web page, and then you can uh, respond. This is just sort of a trial. Okay, coffee, same. Salad, nice. Soup, okay, you guys are getting the hang of it. I'll give you all a chance. I'm seeing 13 people on right now. Nothing, oh, hope you're feeling okay, bud. Okay, um, very cool. Ravioli, soup, salad. Lots of sandwiches, nice, okay. See this word cloud, if, if you don't know what to say, you could just put in sandwich and watch the word get bigger. Always fun. Got 60 people on the call, so I'm gonna give it a sec. Ribs, nice, sounds like leftovers. Nothing yet. Yeah, I eat my lunch a little late too, it's fine. I Thanks think I know who much. put in Diet Pepsi. Not that I'll call it that note. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. a good answer. <laughs> so I will, um, I'll, so each slide that I've got prepared has this QR code on it. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, so if you want to join a little bit later, that's fine too. All right, so I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so here we'll get into the uh, meat of the, um, I guess, uh, in, engaging piece. So uh, for starters, have you noticed consumer to consumer online food sales in your jurisdiction? Way more than I used to. Daily issue, not really, okay. I'm curious if you're willing to share for those who have responded, not really, if you have any um, guesses as to why that is the case. Um, it may be in the chat. Glad to see we have a few more people using it now. So overall, it seems like that it's it's way more than people used to see, and and for some, it's a daily issue. So I'll go ahead and continue on. Um, what's the wildest online food sale you've received a complaint about? And again, if you're joining a little bit late, you can just use the QR code to join. Jarred clams, wolf. It gave me a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> Christmas supper, like a whole thing, wow. <laughs> Bear meat, yeah. Person, oh no. <laughs> Preserves, just food generally. All right. Preserves. I'm hoping person was maybe, why is it getting bigger? <laughs> um. <laughs> what is going on in Alberta? Yeah. Why so many yeah. persons? <laughs> we could a play to about the person, <laughs> not about the person being offered his food. <laughs> um, many different ethnic PHFs. Yeah, that's that's something that we've heard a lot of for sure. Um, low risk, but not actually. Yep, yep. Biryani, mm, delicious, but you know, shouldn't sell it on marketplace. Arm. That's an Albertan delicacy. Fish. Okay. Okay, we're gonna. I, I'm seeing that we're 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 getting low on time, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue advancing slides. But these are interesting, and I would say consistent answers with what we saw um, at the Sci-Fi conference. 
Um, okay, so here, how does your jurisdiction handle consumer to consumer online food sales? Is it complaint based? Are there designated staff? I should also add, this is all anonymous. So, and there's also going to be an option to start voting in a little bit. And it seems like uh, literally all of the answers are complaint. Is there anything other than complaint based? Speak now. I think in Alberta, with you mostly being Alberta Health Services, it's one jurisdiction. Yep. So that is all okay. handled. <laughs> yep. Um, you can go ahead and vote if you'd like to, but I think there's no reason to, so I'm just gonna go ahead and advance the slide. <laughs> All right, big votes, big votes. Okay, what is the riskiest aspect of online food sales in your opinion? And I think this one is going to have a um, voting option as well. But I'll let you put in your response. Dumb people, uh, reach unregulated, foodborne illness, storage, contamination, temperature abuse, yeah, false sense of security, so true, death, yeah, sale of potentially hazardous foods, FBI again, sale of uninspected, raw milk, uninspected meat, yeah, uninspected ingredients, that's, that's a one we have in BC as well that comes to mind, complex foods prepared at home, lack of food safety, okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, give you the option to vote if you would like to, but I think we have a pretty good sense of responses. So, these are all great answers. Thank you. Okay. And then, um, what complicates online food sales most? What fr frustrates you about them? And you, again, there will be the option to vote, but we're, we are a pretty small group, and I feel like there will probably be a lot of the same answers. So, just feel free to go ahead and respond capacity to handle yeah resources. I assume there's no designated staff. Can't keep track too many anonymity on social media. This is one I've heard a lot where like, you know, people can get in trouble, but then they just pop up under a different name. Consistency, no legislation, many factors, follow up. Yeah. Hard to identify them. It's like chasing your tail. You can't find these people, and there's often a language barrier that would make it really difficult for sure. Can't be sure where the food was actually made. Too much public buy in. I'll go ahead and enable voting if there's anything that um, re like resonates in particular with you. And we're almost through the interactive portion. Thank you for your votes. And then what online food sale uh, platforms are you aware of? Any that come to mind? I think this one has unlimited responses. Facebook Marketplace, yep. <laughs> Does Facebook just get huge on your screen too? Yep. Instagram, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm kind of surprised about that to be honest. I don't know how that would work, but I'll, I'll look into it. Kijiji, yep. Place. Too good to go, I've heard of that. I think that's the like leftover one, right? Excellent. We're running out, so I'll continue on. What sort of resources would make, be the most helpful to manage online food sales or make them safer? Um, please vote on any responses you agree with and you have up to three votes to cast. Um, so uh, you can do the free text right now and then I'll enable voting. Secret shopper, yep, more public education. Platforms just simply not allowing it. Police enforcement, since they're private residences, I've heard a lot of issues with the, like, what can you do, right? Ban them. Educating people, consistent regulatory approach, regulation specific government support, jail time. Get the platforms to prohibit it. Okay, I'm gonna enable voting. 
client from platforms, public shaming. Let's use a bell. Make them walk down the street. It's a Game of Thrones reference. Uh, and a couple more seconds to vote. Okay, this is, yeah, you guys are really getting the hang of it. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. And then this is the last one, I think. No, second last. Do you have any final thoughts about online food sales that we can bring back to the working group? And then um, the last one will just be any final questions for us. <laughs> We're doing what we can. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, gratitude. The allowance of low risk food sales has complicated controlling online sales. Yeah, the, that that makes a lot of sense. People need to be aware of what low risk really means, right? Um, developing a realistic regulatory standard, complainants or commercial operators trying to stay within the rules. This is the other side of it for sure. Um, it's a growing problem. Yeah. Thank you for the thank you. I recognize it's 11.30, so I will go ahead and continue. And if there's any last thoughts that you have about anything that we can address, I don't know, in, in a minute or... The presentation like was actually scheduled for an hour, but I think your invite oh, said half an hour. So. It did. Oh. I wouldn't have had to talk so fast, Megan. I thought it was only a half an hour. <laughs> Whoops. That was the invite. <laughs> I just realized that when I looked at the invite, so that was my bad. So oh. It's okay. These things happen. It's yes. So I guess we have a few more, week. more time for questions. Yes. Yeah. yeah, totally. <laughs> if you have any questions or final thoughts, you can use this slide as well for any final thoughts. And this one does have a voting option, but I won't enable it. I'll just let you put in any questions you might have. What is the best way forward? That's a great question. Um, I guess, I mean, I don't know that I can respond on behalf of the working group, but my personal opinion is that educating consumers is really important. Because I think it'll be hard to, I think that there were some great um, ideas about how to move forward, but I think that the lowest hanging fruit right now, the easiest way to get traction on this issue is to have people aware of like what what is at stake, you know? Kelsey, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I'd agree with that. And I think I saw this mentioned and it's something the working group is working on is is getting that platform buy-in as well or finding other ways we can mm -hmm. um, digitally share that. That kind of goes hand in hand with your answer, Natalia. I would agree. Yeah, I've been thinking That's what we have the capacity for right now. It isn't to send inspectors out to tackle all of these. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody, and I know nowhere in the country has time for that. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I know Marketplace does have like limitations on what can be sold. I remember um, like medical devices, for example, like you, you can't. I remember trying to find like a um, like a pump when I when I had a baby and I couldn't find like a breast pump online because you know, it's it's recognized as a, a device that you shouldn't be shared among people. Um, anyway, uh, continuing on, coordinated Canada-wide education campaigns. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great. And CFIA did do a bit of that earlier this year, last year. Tally, do you remember? Um, I think it was January 2023, yeah. if I recall correctly. Yeah, so I yeah. think that's a good suggestion and I think it's something that they're interested at a federal level building on and hopefully through this working group can see how the PTs can support or use that as well. Yeah. Um, anyone contacting the platforms to stop people from advertising food sales? Um, not that I know of, um, but again, I work in a policy capacity, so um, that would that could be something that the health authorities are doing, but not that I'm aware of, just from a resourcing perspective. And that's just a BC answer. Yeah. And I think from a regulatory perspective, although we're not done our scan yet, um, none of the provinces and territories have uh, specific enough regulations to to sort of enable them 
to do this or to it would have to be in response to certain scenarios, not as a blanket. You can't sell it. So you can't sell that food because it's made people sick is an ability we all have. But you can't sell all foods in this way because it might make someone sick is is a little bit jurisdictionally and regulatory of a gray area. Um, the advertising of food online is a federal responsibility. Um, so there is a route for the advertising of it, um, but not for the actual sales of the food themselves and the outcome. So that is, as Natalia mentioned, one of the goals of the working group is to clarify that um, jurisdictional responsibility, responsibility, responsibility <laughs> and regulatory <laughs> abilities uh, across the PTs uh, to, to be able to stop if that's the direction that, that seems to be of the most benefit. Well put. Um, I remember being told, don't go looking for these online sales because you'll drown. So how on earth do we not drown with the growth of these sales? I mean, thank you for all the work that you guys do um, and making you know the world a safer place. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer mm -hmm. to this is. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we have the online food sales working group and you know people are more aware of it. Um, and I do think consumer education will help, like just sort of that, um, I guess the, the, the more, um, the consumers who are willing to like take a closer look at the label, that sort of thing, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add, Kelsey. No, I would echo your thank you. We recognize how much work that is. I've been in the field and, and yeah, you will drown if you go looking for these. There are way too many. And as I mentioned earlier, you tell this one to shut down and they just pop up over here as someone else or over here as someone else. And and I think that's largely why in most jurisdictions it is complaint based or almost no response at all, which is what the feedback we saw when we were in St. John. Um, even when I was preparing the slide and went down my Facebook search and query, there was there were pages and pages and pages and pages. And I I was just looking and taking screenshots for a presentation. It wasn't even addressing them. So um I think there's that saying about eating an elephant a bite at a time and this is probably like a massive elephant <laughs> and it's it's not going to be solved by one approach uh, or by proactively trying to hunt them all down because it just won't work and so we need to take it you know sort of a multi-pronged approach and where are we going to get the most bang for a buck and as Natalia mentioned and, and people have mentioned in our feedback that um, public education is probably going to be the starting point for that just because of the type of elephant this is. For yeah, sure. thinking exactly. with that analogy. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. Um, what challenges is the team facing to mitigate the risk of online food sales? Um, I assume that means like working group, and in that case, I would say just um, what I'd mentioned about you know different sort of jurisdictional requirements and regulations in place across um, you know, the provinces and territories make it a little bit challenging, but we are sort of focusing now um, our efforts on on looking into educating consumers. Um, but yeah, I would say a, a challenge is just um, uh, that it's it can't be a one size fits all approach for in terms of like regulatory guidance. Mm -hmm. um, so looking looking for a way around that. Um, yeah, I agree. A, okay. Um, I think these are just responses from the previous questions of finding a, a way to license and get contact information for delivery service owners. It's a great suggestion. Um, should do a media campaign educating people. Yep, I think if CFIA does something like that, again, I think it would be helpful to have um, the PT sort of on board and, and amplifying any communication. I don't know about um, you guys, but I mean, I follow CFIA, I think, on social media, and I mean, I'm not on it all that often, but I haven't really seen um, a whole lot about this. So um, maybe it's just a matter of timing and stuff like that, too. Um, then to practically deal with online food sales, we'd require an influx of resources. Totally understood. Um, and yeah, I just I don't know that that's I mean, it would that would require a lot of sort of, you know, resourcing and effort on. Um, at different levels, which I think might be tricky, but understood. Um, work with new Canadian Education Immigration Canada contacts. I think that's a that's a good suggestion too. Um, there's, it, it seems like there, are, based on what I've seen on Facebook Marketplace, it does seem like that's 
it's sort of a lot of the time it's sort of um, ethnic food that might not be readily available in restaurants in in, a, in an area yet so people are, are finding it where they can you know so I think that's a great suggestion and then um, if, is it CFIA that deals with advertising I would say yes because um, they like deal with claims and labeling that sort of thing um, yep Kelsey, that's my else? understanding as well um, but that was one of the questions that drove the creation of this working group because that wasn't clear at a PT level um, what that means and so we you know and what what does that cover and then how do we relate back to that as a province or as a health authority uh, when we are having these issues even if it's just complaint based coming in so um, that is something the working group is working on clarifying with uh, the CFIA and then just back to the new Canadian uh, education and immigration context. Um, we have had that conversation and <laughs> continue to have that conversation at the online food sales working group because we do have to, I mean, obviously consider some of the social and cultural determinants of health that do play into why these are so pervasive in some communities and for some groups of, of food. And it definitely feels like an area where education and appropriate education language and cultural specific education uh, would benefit greatly in terms of, of how these um, play out and, and maybe can follow the, you know, the current regulatory structure if we need to look at, at changes to that. Um, there was an example of a, that we didn't put in the presentation, but of a woman who moved to California from Mexico and couldn't find this very specific food that she used to eat all the time back in her province in Mexico. So she started making it, she taught her mom and her sister how to make it and they made it out of their house and they sold it online. Um, and it was almost a test run. First, they got access to their thing. And then when it became really popular, they thought, hey, this is a viable business. And then they did end up opening a cafe and food production to be able to make this product. Um, but they didn't know the market well enough they did to know if they should invest in a legitimate, I'll say legitimate, or like legal storefront, brick and mortar, whatever you want to call it, um, proper food business until they sort of test ran it through this gray area online food sales um, and so even just educating how you get to working within the current regulatory requirements I think would be beneficial in those areas as well. Agreed. We, um, I see another um, suggestion food regulations overall need to be more strict and need to have harsher penalties. Um, yeah I mean it's I, I think people just don't understand what the risks are of, of eating something that you know they don't know the source of or you know I guess I, I the way I explain it to my team here like in health protection branch outside of food safety is that when everything's going right like you don't hear about food safety right so um uh I agree um and then I see one more question that came up. Would it be possible to advertise the risks and regulatory information on the same platforms that online food sales operators frequent? Maybe even require sites to post eat at your own risk disclaimers. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but it does sound like a pretty good middle ground if they can't just straight up, you know, like ban online food sales on um, social media platforms. Yeah, and I think it's something we're exploring and it ties into a conversation we've had about um, most regulatory requirements requiring places who are permitted or licensed to display that to the public and how there isn't a, a mechanism for that and so to tie that in as well. So we did really focus on the consumer to consumer sales for online, but the working group is covering sort of all types of sales because I know there's a question there about delivery, uh, which really is mm -hmm. business to consumer uh, and then, you know, that this question could be broader and integrate into that as well. So I think it's a good point that we can bring back to the group to explore further. Definitely. I don't see any other questions coming in, but um, thank you so much for your time and attention and um, all the great feedback we've received. We'll definitely bring this back to the working group. Um, and it sort of fleshes out, I think, what we heard at the sci-fi conference as well. So thank you. Definitely. I didn't stop sharing.
Well, thank you so much for the presentation and the the engaging kind of format with the polls and the questions. So um, yeah, on behalf of the Alberta branch, um, I want to thank you guys for the presentation. Um, I did record it. Um, are you guys okay if I share it to individuals on the call and members, or would you prefer we don't share it? It's okay to share. Thanks. We got yeah, be okay from the working group for it to be available Perfect. too. So yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey and Natalia. Um, and thank you everybody. Uh, who attended today. So have a great rest of the week and uh, yeah, we'll chat soon.